We're coming to the end of the subjects for which I plan to do issue spotting of past essays for bar exams. California civil procedure is, I believe, the least frequently tested subject on the California bar exam. But if there's other content that you would like to see, please let me know. I need to hear from people whether some particular thing that I could record would be helpful to you. I said this is very infrequently tested, California Civil Procedure. One time it was tested was July 2016, and Dr. Sacuzo talked about this hypothetical. So let's take a look at it. We have Paul, a citizen of Mexico, attending college in San Diego on a student visa, drives to San Francisco, buys a snack and eats it. He buys the snack from Valerie, a resident of San Francisco. The snack was manufactured in Germany. They contained a toxic substance, sickened Paul to the tune of $50,000 in damage, and damages were limited to $50,000. No other damages. He files an action pro se against Valerie and the German company Meyer Corporation in Superior Court, and he's alleging $50,000 in damages. In serving the complaint, he drives to San Francisco, he personally hands Valerie a summons, and then he sends a copy of the complaint to, by ordinary mail, that's a key word that they use, ordinary mail, to the German company. Call one went to personal service. They asked you if Valerie and Meyer Corp were served properly. We should look at our key facts. Okay, um, turns out that the, the plaintiff cannot serve the defendant. So when he drives up and serves Valerie personally, that was inappropriate and it wasn't effective service. All right, Meyer Corp, they told you he used ordinary mail. That should have screamed out to you. Well, maybe he shouldn't use ordinary mail. Maybe he should use first class or certified. And that was the answer. The second call went to personal jurisdiction. And now they said, does the court have personal jurisdiction over Valerie? And actually, the court was in San Diego. Turns out that Paul, who's living in San Diego, files his complaint in San Diego. And the question is, first question you want to ask is, well, can he do it? Yeah, of course he can do it. Nothing's stopping him. And the San Diego court will hear the case unless there's an objection or they don't have the jurisdiction. All right, so it was okay to file in San Diego. So they said, does the San Diego Superior Court have personal jurisdiction over Valerie and Meyer Court? Well, all right, so there's a system that you have to use when you're discussing personal jurisdiction. And personal jurisdiction could be up there again. So you've got to be sure to know what to do. The first thing you want to do is look at the traditional basis for jurisdiction. Personal service in the state, domiciled in the, in the state, or you consent, and you consent by waiver, and that's failure to, to um, object to personal jurisdiction in your first response to the court. You must object or it's waived, or you can consent in a forum clause. And what you want to do is go through, um, well, there no facts, well, the personal service, of course, didn't work, but uh, here it is, she is, domiciled in the county of San Francisco. So she lives here. <laughs> the state has jurisdiction over her. She lives here. California has personal jurisdiction over her. So that should be easy. Now we go to, to the German company, Meyer Corp. And here's where we must continue our analysis. Meyer Corp is out of state. So what we have to say is when we have an out of state residence, due process requires 
that the state have a long arm statute and that you meet the test in international shoe. And you need to tell the bar examiners that, just that. And is there a long arm statute? Yes, California has a long arm statute. Put that down. California has a long arm statute, says we can exercise personal jurisdiction to the extent of the US and California constitutions, which just means to the extent of due process. And to the extent of due process means meet the test in international shoe. So then what you have to do is your test in international shoe, purposeful availment, the fairness, fair play, substantial justice, and what you want to do is mainly, mainly count the contacts and go over each contact. Tell the bar examiners all the contacts. So it's usually about contacts. What do we have here? We have, well, you could speculate, gee whiz, they were in the business for 20 years, but that's all speculation. We have one contact that we know about for sure. All right, so is that good enough? for personal jurisdiction. Now here's something that a lot of people uh, don't seem to know, or if they know it, they don't put it down. You do your test in international shoe, purposeful availment, and did they anticipate a lawsuit, and so on. And of course, you're, you're making sure you're making note of the contacts. And then, here's what the courts do and that you should do the same. The courts will say, okay, we've looked at the contacts and the whole test in international shoe. Now, the next question is, does this meet the standard for general jurisdiction? To meet the standard for general jurisdiction, the contacts have to be systematic, extensive, continuous, systematic, extensive, continuous, systematic, extensive. Now, looking at ours, they weren't continuous, systematic, and extensive. We have only one. All right. Can we still get jurisdiction? Yes. We get jurisdiction for what's called specific jurisdiction. And you should tell the bar examiners that. Specific jurisdiction asks us, is there a nexus or connection between the contact and the harm? In this case, they send over a snack that has a toxic substance in it, it caused harm, and we're suing because of that harm. So there you go, there's your nexus. Therefore, the California court would have specific jurisdiction over Meyer Corp. They have general jurisdiction over Valerie, she's a resident. Okay, let's see what happens next. Next, they say, so let's, in summary, the California, the San Diego, California court, it's in California, and California has jurisdiction over both of them. So the San Diego court would have jurisdiction over both of them. What you want to do when you approach these problems is talk your way through the answer so that you arrive at the right answer. You discuss it the way I'm discussing it with you. Just do that. The next question they asked was venue. All right, now you wonder, what's the rule? The rule is, in state court, the county of defendants' residence. There's also, you can also use where the harm occurred, but the first preference would be the county of residence. Guess what? Valerie lives in San Francisco. So venue would not be proper in San Diego. But that was it, that was easy. And then finally, they said, is the case removable? To re be removable, you needed to have subject matter jurisdiction. That would be a good faith uh, claim of more than 75,000 and complete diversity of citizenship. Here we have complete diversity of citizenship, but the claim is only 50,000. There's no subject matter jurisdiction. Federal court can't hear this case. By the way, for your multiple choice when you're figuring these out, if there's subject matter jurisdiction anywhere in any state, there'll be subject matter jurisdiction in every state because you'll meet the good faith claim of more than 75,000 and co complete diversity of citizenship, except where there's not complete diversity of citizenship. So, all right. 
Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Yeah, that was relatively easy, wasn't it? If you know federal civil procedure, then you can learn the California distinctions fairly rapidly. If you haven't already watched the webinar that I posted, I think a few days ago, where Dr. Sacuso talks about some big issues that might arise in California civil procedure, then please go back and watch that, and that will give you a large part of what you need to know for California civil procedure.